Our title tonight is The Covenant with Abraham, also known as the Abrahamic Covenant. So at this time, we are learning about covenants. So why is it important to study God's covenants in the Bible? The reason is because in the covenants are God's promises and plans regarding how He will save us. So when we learn about the covenant and realize God's covenants, we will know His plans for us, His plan of salvation. So especially at this time, let us learn about the covenant made with our father of faith, Abraham. So God's covenant with Abraham shows us, number one, this covenant shows the way of the seed of the woman who is the Messiah. So this covenant originates from the promise God made regarding the seed of the woman back in the time of Adam and Eve. So we must know the lineage of the Messiah is from the Israelites. The Messiah is to come through the descendants of Abraham. So how important is this covenant? And the place where the Messiah comes from is the land of Canaan. So we know that the Israelites' promised land was Canaan. So how important is this covenant? And if we look at Genesis 12, 7, we see the covenant that was made to Abraham. It says, to your descendants, I will give this land. So this is the focus of the covenant. God promised Abraham's descendants that he would give them the land, which is Canaan. And through Abraham's descendants, the Messiah would come, which was already prophesied during the time of Adam and Eve, when God promised them the seed of the woman, who is the Messiah. And in Galatians 3.16, it talks about Abraham's descendants, that through them, the Messiah will be born in the land that God gives them. So we see that is not seeds, but one seed, rather to one, and to your seed, that is Christ. So this covenant with Abraham is important because it leads to the Messiah, the Christ. And what is the second characteristic of a covenant with Abraham? It is a covenant that establishes the kingdom of God on earth. So God's kingdom must have people and a kingdom. So first, there must be a kingdom of God's people here on this earth. And there are three elements that make up a nation or a kingdom. America is a king kingdom, in a sense. America is a nation. And we know in order to have a nation, 
You need sovereignty, someone to rule. You need people. And you need land. In order to make up a nation, you need all three of these. So the same is true for God's kingdom. Three elements such as these must be established, and they were established through Abraham. So first, sovereignty. So who is the sovereign in God's kingdom? It is God. And it is God's unilateral sovereignty to enter into the covenant with Abraham. So in order to establish God's kingdom, God entered into a unilateral covenant with Abraham, and he became the unilateral sovereignty. And what else is needed to establish God's kingdom? People. And these people were the descendants of Abraham, who later, later became the people of Israel. And lastly, land. And what land was given to them? It was Canaan, the land of promise. God promised Abraham, your descendants will be given this land, Canaan. And this became the contents of the covenant given to Abraham. So the components that make up the kingdom of God fulfilled in heaven, it is the same as on earth. You also need a sovereignty in God's kingdom in heaven. And you also need people, God's people, to be in heaven. And the land? Well, here we have heaven on earth. There will be a new heavens and new earth. So if you understand carefully, we have to understand that God's kingdom, which is established through Abraham's descendants, it must first come true here on this earth first. And then it is established in heaven in God's kingdom, in heaven, afterwards. And Jesus Christ, he knew of this covenant with Abraham. So in Luke 17, 20 through 21, this is what he says. He knew that the Pharisees were asking him, when the kingdom of God would come. And Jesus replied, The kingdom of God does not come with your careful observation. Nor will people say, Here it is or there it is, because the kingdom of God is within you. So God's kingdom must first be realized in our hearts first, here on earth first. And so he's reminding them about the covenant with Abraham. God's kingdom was supposed to be established here on the earth first with God's people, Abraham's descendants. But what happened? What happened to the Israelites? They were conquered by the Babylonians and the Assyrians. And the Gentile nations crushed southern Judah, and northern Israel. So Jesus is telling them, this kingdom of God is not here or there. It's in you. It must be established on this earth first in you before it is in heaven. Therefore, Jesus said this in Matthew sixteen nineteen. He spoke this to Peter. He said, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. He didn't say, I will give you the kingdom, but he said, I will give you the keys. 
with and with this, it was supposed to open the doors to heaven. And then Jesus said, And whatever you bind on earth shall have been bound in heaven, and whatever you lose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. So whatever you lock in this earth, it will be locked in heaven. What is he talking about? Our hearts. Your heart is so important. You must have heaven in your heart first, and then you have the keys to open heaven's doors. Please believe this. Some people say, oh, this world is like living in hell. I'm living in hell. I'm suffering. So I can't wait till I go to heaven. But that is wrong train of thinking. Jesus said this clearly. He gives us the kings of the kingdom of heaven. So if you open the doors on earth, it will open in heaven. So what does this mean? In this world, on this earth, your keys must open heaven in your heart first. Or How do you think you can go to heaven when you think, I'm living in hell, and you live hellish like this? Do you think you can go to heaven? God doesn't want this. He wants to, you to have peace in your heart, heaven in your heart, no matter what suffering you may be going through, inside our hearts. God must be there. And when God is in there, you are in heaven. Please believe this. And we have that key. So we must understand that we must make the same confession of faith as Peter did when we receive the keys to heaven. So there is nothing else but Peter's confession. And what is it? It's found in Matthew 16, 16. And we must confess it with faith. Let's read it together. Ready, begin. Simon Peter answered, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Amen. Is it hard or easy? It is an easy confession and short. Confess that Christ is the Son of God. And then you have the keys to heaven. So everyone sitting here tonight, you all believe Jesus is the Messiah. You believe that he is the Son of God. We confess this. So what have we received then? We have received the keys to heaven. Please believe this. You have it in your hand. You don't have to say, give it to me. You have it just by that confession. So what a blessing is this? So we must know also this importance. That Jesus also said, whatever you bound in earth, you will bind in heaven. So if you lock things on the earth, then you will lock heaven. So you must open your heart. Your key is to open your heart so that you will receive the key and enter heaven. Your heart is the land. You are the people of God. God is your sovereign. So your work, your children, your family, your health, all you have to do is rely on God, trust in Him. Don't doubt Him. And then your heart becomes heaven. Your children, your family becomes heaven because you have God in your heart. So please believe that you are in heaven now when God is in you, in your heart, in the land of your heart. So what is the third characteristic of the covenant with Abraham? It is a covenant that has been repeated and confirmed seven times. So this covenant, it was repeated seven times, but it had the same contents. And we know that number seven is considered the perfect number. So 
So this is how important the covenant with Abraham is, where it was repeated seven times, which represents the perfect number. This shows how important this covenant that was made with Abraham from God is. So first, in Genesis 12, verses 1 through 3, the covenant was made here. And it was made by the calling of Abraham. And the first covenant was, was made with him. And secondly, in Genesis 12, 7, it was the first promise of Canaan regarding the land of Canaan. <coughs> and third, <clears throat> the third covenant is found in Genesis 13, verses 15 through 18 the reaffirmation of the promise of Canaan and descendants. And fourth, it was repeated in Genesis 15 through the covenant of the torch. So the torch represented God, and there were two pieces of meat that were split, and the torch went between them. And this was reaffirming the promise of land and descendants to Abraham. And fifth, God found Abraham again in Genesis 17, verses 9 through 14, and God gave him the covenant of circumcision. <coughs> so the reason why these covenants were repeated was because Abraham's heart kept shaking, disbelieving, so God gave him the covenant of circumcision in Abraham's flesh so he would not forget. And the sixth covenant in Genesis 18.10 was the reaffirmation of the birth of Isaac. Why? Because even at this time, Abraham and Sarah did not have a child yet, so God reconfirmed it through the sixth covenant. And lastly, the seventh covenant found in Genesis 22, verses 15 through 18. This covenant was given after offering Isaac as a burnt offering, and this was the final confirmation of all the covenants given to Abraham. and it made it perfect in Abraham. So these, <clears throat> so these covenants were repeated with Abraham so he would never forget and believe. And what is the fourth characteristic? This covenant was made not only with Abraham, but also with Isaac and Jacob, with three generations of the covenant. And this is found in Psalm 105, verses 8 through 11. And we see it in verse 9. It says, The covenant which he made with Abraham and his oath to Isaac. And also in verse 10, it is given to Abraham's grandson, Jacob. And in verse 11, it says, To you I will give the land of Canaan as the portion of of your inheritance. So it is one covenant, but it was given to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Three generations. This shows the passing down of the covenant regarding the land and descendants. And why? Because this is how important this covenant was. It was not given to only one person, but to three, so they would keep it. So we learned the four characteristics of Abraham's covenant. So we have a mission in learning the Abrahamic covenant as well. And Jesus tells us this in John 8, 39. Why must we learn the Abrahamic covenant? 
So the Pharisees were talking to Jesus at the time, and they answered and said to him, Abraham is our father. And what did Jesus say to these Pharisees and religious leaders? He said, Jesus said to them, if you are Abraham's children, do the deeds of Abraham. So this is our mission in learning this covenant. So the deeds in Greek is ergon. It is the plural form of the word deed. So ergon means deeds. And Jesus told them, if you are Abraham's children, do the deeds of Abraham, which is not one thing, but all of them. So today, if we believe in Jesus Christ, we are also descendants of Abraham. You must know that the lineal or direct descendants of Abraham are not the true descendants, but those who do the deeds of Abraham. What are the deeds of Abraham? Number one, forgiveness and humility that shows a broad heart. That is the first deed of Abraham we must practice. We know that when Abraham left Ur of the Chaldeans, he left with his wife Sarah and also his nephew Lot. So Lot was Abraham's nephew. And Abraham was Lot's youngest uncle. But they left Ur of the Chaldeans and became rich in a foreign nation due to Abraham. But eventually... Their wealth began to collide with one another. And Lot realized that he could lose his wealth because of the limited space of the land. So Lot left Abraham, and we see this in Genesis 13, verses 6 through 7. So Abraham had many possessions, animals, livestock, and so did Lot. And they had many shepherds. And there was strife between the herdsmen of Abraham's livestock and Lot's livestock. So the younger one, the nephew, he should give respect to his uncle, the older elder, and say, Abraham, Please, let do as you wish. But this did not happen. Abraham is the one who allowed Lot to do what he wanted to do. He gave him the first option. Abraham said in Genesis 13, 8 through 9, Please, let there be no strife. And Abraham says, If to the left, then I will go to the right. Or if to the right, then I will go to the left. So Abraham gives Lot, the first right decision to choose the land he wants to go to. Now, Lot at this time shouldn't have left Abraham. He should have stayed with him. After all, Abraham was the reason for Lot's wealth. But after this, Lot leaves Abraham. He goes for the better land, and Abraham is left alone. But Abraham is blessed even more abundantly. But what happens to Lot? He almost gets swept away in the judgment of Sodom and Gomorrah. So we see what a broad and humble heart Abraham had. What was the second deed of Abraham? His continuous intercessory prayers for others. So he prayed for those who were at the hands of those who could bring him mercy for the pitiful ones. So God told Abraham that he was going to judge the city of Sodom. So Abraham gave many intercessory prayers to God so that Lot would be saved. So think about this. 
Lot left Abraham. Why did he leave? Because Lot wanted to save his wealth. So how hurt Abraham must have been. But Abraham's first deed was forgiveness and hum humility. And then his second deed was continuous intercessory prayers to save Lot. Because God told Abraham he was going to destroy the land that Lot lived in. And so in Genesis chapter 18, Abraham says, if there are only 50 righteous men, will you relent? But there were not 50 righteous men, not even 45 righteous men, and not 40, and not 30. So Abraham prayed again, what if there were 20 righteous men? There were not. So Abraham thought there could be 10 righteous, but not even 10 righteous men were in Sodom. So God judged the land of Sodom. So who would die too then? Wouldn't it be Lot? However, God, who understood Abraham's love for Lot, thought of Abraham, remembered Abraham, and therefore saved Lot because of Abraham. So God was is going to judge Sodom because there weren't even 10 righteous men there. But because of Abraham, he saved Lot. And this is found in Genesis nineteen twenty nine. Let us read it together. Ready, begin. Thus it came about when God destroyed the cities of the valley that God remembered Abraham and sent Lot out of the midst of the overthrow when he overthrew the cities in which Lot lived. So it's not because Lot was so faithful that he was saved, but it was because of these intercessory prayers from Abraham that God remembered him, and then he saved Lot. So if we are Abraham's descendants, that we must do the deeds of Abraham. We must have intercessory prayers for others as well. We must make these special, precious prayers for others. And when God remembers your earnest prayer to save others, then you must believe that through your tears, through your sorrowful heart, that God will save them because of you, because you too are a true descendant of Abraham. Please believe this. So during this time of Lent, remember how the Lord died on the cross for us. And there are so many around us who are suffering more than us. And yes, even ourselves, we are suffering. But if you think carefully, there are even people suffering more than you, whether it be your family member, a friend, a co-worker, church member, please pray for them. Be like Abraham and give intercessory prayers for them. I bless this upon you in the name of the Lord. So what else is the deeds of Abraham? Number three, through tra thorough transmission of faith to your family members and descendants. You must do this. You must transmit your faith to your family and descendants. You must know why God called Abraham. Do you know why? Usually people think, oh, God called Abraham because he wanted to make him faithful. But the Bible gives a specific reason why God called Abraham. And this is found in Genesis eighteen nineteen. It says, For I have chosen him in order that he may command his children and his household. That is why God called Abraham. So what do we have to learn from this? That like Abraham, we must teach our children 
our family, our descendants, God's ways, God's word. And this is why God chose Abraham. And this is so important. You have to understand, when you come out here with your family, God is so pleased in this. You are doing exactly the deeds of Abraham. You are making your children, your household, your descendants follow the ways of God. So what will happen when you pass on the word of God to your family? You will receive the same blessings as Abraham. And this is found in Galatians 3.9. It says, So then those who are of faith are blessed with Abraham, the believer. So we know Abraham's life was great. It wasn't that he was just so wealthy. But he had so many descendants. And he had a child grandchild, great-grandchild, that follow the will of God. How great is that? So that is the greatest blessing that Abraham received, and that is ours as well. So the greatest blessing that Abraham received, it is also the blessing of entering the kingdom of heaven and enjoying eternal life. And this is from the Matthew 8.11. Let us read this last verse together. Ready, begin. I say to you that many will come from east and west and recline at the table with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. So when you go to heaven, it won't be only you. Well, Abraham will be there, and Isaac, and Jacob. Why do you think the Bible records these three lines of descendants? It is because of what we have read in Genesis eighteen nineteen. God chose Abraham because he would command his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord. And he did just that. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, they followed the ways of the Lord. So if Abraham was there, his children are there too. Because Abraham taught them the ways of the Lord well. So in this time of Lent, let us not be like Lot, who are only greedy for these good things in the world. But let us be like Abraham, who looks to the heavenly things, who follows the command of God and passes it on to their children. I bless us upon you in the name of the Lord. Let us pray. Lord, Father God, we thank you. Tonight, through the covenant with Abraham, we have learned, especially during this time of Lent, how we are to live as your child. And we thank you for this word you have given us tonight. We live in this world, and there's so many chains that are attached to us. But Father God, now that we know about this covenant, the covenant that is given to Abraham is and his descendants, and that we are also his descendants, please let us live the way that Abraham did, and may we be his true descendant. May we have the promise of heaven, not only for us, but for our family members, our children, ones that come after us. May we teach them in the ways of the Lord. And may we do the deeds of Abraham so that we may live victorious in this world. And it will not happen according to our own strength, but we know it will only happen when you help us, when we pray, 
And then this word will come into reality in our lives for our families. And that you have given us the keys to heaven and we will be able to open it because we believe in you and have you in our heart. We thank you and we pray in the loving name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Let us give glory to God.